and welcome to Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Burnsville, Minnesota. I'm Nina, and these are your weekly video announcements. Are you looking for ways to serve at Prince of Peace? Well, we have an exciting new volunteer opportunity for someone who thrives on delivering great hospitality and would enjoy being the first friendly face visitors see when coming through our front doors. If this describes you, our new evening front desk volunteer position may be a great fit. If you're interested in learning more, please connect with our Community Life Director, Amy Kelso. There are many opportunities to serve throughout the year as part of an ongoing or one-time commitment. To learn more about all of our volunteer opportunities here at Prince of Peace, you can head to the volunteer page on our website. 
This month, we're focusing on distributing hygiene kits to the guests served at Mission Outpost. We're collecting hygiene kits made up of shampoo and conditioner, toothpaste and toothbrush, soap and deodorant. Put all of these items into a plastic bag and drop off at the Mission Outpost entrance during donation hours, which you can find listed on our website, or at the small donation bin located next to the elevator on our main floor. For more information about our ministry, ways to connect, or resource downloads, please visit our website or check out our social media channels. Whether you're here on campus or online, we're thrilled to have you share this worship experience with us. Today, we're embarking on a brand new worship series designed to help us discover fresh rhythms for connecting with God, not just on Sundays, but every day. Let's join together to be inspired and to encounter God in powerful new ways. And here's a song that perfectly captures the feeling of a new beginning. Glorious day. Welcome to worship. Let's all stand and sing together. Glorious day. was my tomb till I met you.
You may be seated. Well, friends, welcome to worship. So glad that you are here today. My name is Paul Gaucher. I am one of the pastors on staff. And on behalf of all who are serving and leading today, our people in the booth and making our sound and lights look great, our musicians, our greeters, and, uh, and our ushers, and, and all of that. And, you know, it smells like bacon again this morning. So men's ministry is here preparing a breakfast, and the quilters are out there. It's a, a great morning to celebrate. Uh, so glad that you are here. If you are a guest with us this morning... A warm welcome to you. If you have questions about how to step more deeply into the mission and the ministry here at Prince of Peace from wherever you are, uh, there's someone at the uh, Connect desk in the community room. would love to have a chat with you, or you can just reach out, give us a call. And a special welcome to those of you who are worshiping uh, at home, wherever you are. We see you Memphis. We see you Seattle. We see you Florida. Who else do we see? We see you Washington State. Where? Who? Texas, we see you, Texas. So glad that you're joining us uh, today as well. Again, if there's anything that we can do to make this feel as live and vibrant uh, in your place as it is here this morning, we want to be about that. As you came in this morning, you should have received the handout. If you'll just take a quick peek at that, I want to orient you to this on one side on the front. Uh, there's all kinds of information about upcoming events in the life of our congregation. There's a connection card at the bottom. It's perforated. You can tear that off if you're here. Uh, you can be in touch with us about anything that you'd like to be in touch with us about. And on the back side, there are some devotional materials about what we're talking about today and as we move through the next season, as well as the spiritual care request. We would love to be connected uh, to you about all of that. Well, friends, we are beginning a new worship series called Thrivera. The intention of our series together is to explore what it means to thrive, to have life and more life in every era, in every time, in every moment uh, of our lives. Over the next seven weeks, we'll be exploring our identity as Christ followers, Christ followers who celebrate the new life of the resurrected Jesus and what that means for us. Along the way, we'll discover what it means to be spirited and creative and connected people called to be present and grateful and generous and missional with our lives. These seven thriving rhythms will help us bring some good to each moment something better to each day and our very best to each other as we encounter the world around us. Uh, if you are making your way through uh, the companion resource that we've created for you, Welcome to Seasons Thrive Era, just want you to know that there are less than 10 copies left of our first run. So if you're wondering about this and sort of holding back, you can talk with Amy at the Connect desk and we'll make sure that you have uh, what you need for moving ahead. And then, friends, one more thing. I trust that you've all received the news this week that I will be concluding my ministry here at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in beautiful downtown Burnsville at the end of June. My last weekend will be June 29th and 30th, which marks the 40th anniversary of my ordination. So there was method to the madness. Someone asked me, like, how long have you been working on this? And I said, well, I think when I started, I kind of thought it would be great to go 40 because 40 years in the promised land is a pretty great thing. And the almost three decades that I have served as your pastor here at Prince of Peace have been among the very best years of my whole life. But friends, here's what I know. There'll be enough time to talk about that and to tend to all that. But for now, let's keep the main thing, the main thing as we gather to worship. So we're so glad that you're here wherever you are. If you can move up out of your seat, move about, welcome each other to worship. Welcome to worship.
Let's remain standing and let's sing together. May be seated. Friends, I'm just aware as we gather to worship this morning that probably a lot of us have had busy weekends so far. Lots to do on a day like yesterday, maybe outside, tending to yard things, house things, maybe gathering with friends and family, a Saturday to be here and there, and then a Sunday morning to be here right now. And if you just stop to think about it, well, we've just been on a tear, haven't we? Lots going on. So as we, as we pause in this time to worship, we, we do so, I believe, wanting to bring our whole selves. If you're like me, I can be my whole self here, but thinking about nine other things. But I've also learned that if we just take a moment to breathe into this moment, that if we arrive at this moment and arrive fully, paying attention to our breath, our heartbeat, that we'll find ourselves creating space inside, and then we notice that God is inhabiting that space. And so in the midst of our busy lives, let's just pause right now. Let's just enjoy a, a moment to breathe and to pray and ask God's Spirit to inhabit the space inside. Let's pray.
Gracious God, as we worship in this space today, as we gather, we bring our whole selves to you, our hearts, our minds, our spirit, our bodies. We come into this present moment to realize that you've been waiting for us. As we gather in your strong name in this Easter season, this season of resurrection, we pray that you'll constantly remind us that you are at work in and through us, that even now you're creating, recreating us in your image and breathing the fresh breathe, breeze of your Holy Spirit into our lives. And so we receive that breath, that spirit breath that brings us back to life. Oh, God, as we worship, deepen our connections with one another and with all whom we meet along the way. Fill every present moment with a profound sense of your presence among us. As we respond to you with our grateful lives today, we thank you for your generous and your extravagant love that sets us free to be your missional people in the world. We pray all of this in the strong name of the risen Christ. And all God's people say, Hi, Pop Kids. We are starting a new worship series that will help us imagine what it means to thrive. And during these weeks, we'll explore what that means and how we do it. But I thought up a few examples to help you awesome kids get a feel for what thriving is all about. Do you know what it feels like to be cruising right along, vibing, getting nothing but net, smooth sailing, keeping all the balls in the air? Or how about this? Can you imagine that feeling of the first warm spring day of the year when you pull out your bike, grab your helmet, and start pedaling? You know that amazing, familiar feeling of gliding down the road at top speed, feeling the wind whipping by almost effortlessly? When we're thriving, we feel kind of like that, grounded and safe, inspired and creative, connected to what's important to us, energized and ready for adventure. Yeah, thriving feels great. But we also know what it feels like when we're not thriving. And that's not something we need to feel bad about. We don't always have everything we need to thrive and it's okay to not always have all of our ducks in a row. Some days we might have no idea where our ducks even are. Let me know if you see any of mine. But in our new series, we'll learn about how getting to know who we are inside, learning about what's important to us, and being connected to God and to others can help us thrive. I can't wait to see what thriving looks like for each of you. Oop, gotta go. Catch you next time, Pop Kids. So that's where you got to. We are spirited, creative, and connected people, called to be present, grateful, generous, and missional with our lives. We want to explore what it means to intentionally live into this particular series of life rhythms, which help us to bring some good to each moment, something better to each day, and our best to each other as we encounter the world around us. Speaking of bringing good to each moment, when our worship team gathered to just preview a couple of the video pieces that we've created, and we got to the one where Emily is doing the children's message, it's like, wait, what? She, she juggles also? That was just such a great, that's just such a great thing. Well, friends, Easter is the story of hope. It's the story of resilience. It is a story of thriving. For 2,000 years, 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we celebrated last Sunday and every day since and will continue to celebrate into the future has been the absolute central event that has helped Christ followers and others, all people, reframe and imagine everything. When Jesus was raised from the dead and he walked out of the tomb on that first Easter morning, everything changed. Everything changed. Not just for a few people there and then, but for all people everywhere, here and now, forever. And as 21st century Christ followers, we stand at the doorway of the empty tomb together. And the challenge for us is to come to terms with that life to death, back to life again event means for us in our lives. How do we embody the power of the resurrection in our lives? As we stand at the open door of that empty tomb, we are faced with a very important decision. Do we just stand there and look in? Do we peer into the past where Christ was? Or will we turn around and look out and beyond to where Christ is leading us? In 2016, that decision became very real for me in my life. In the late summer and early fall of 2016, I experienced three turning points, three catalytic events, one right after the next, that generated a major shift in my life. There was a hike, there was a crash, and then there was a death. For two weeks in mid-August, as some of you may recall, I hiked along Minnesota's Superior Hiking Trail, covering over 150 miles during those two weeks. You were generous, you were patient with a preacher who seemed to weave in some story of the preparation for that long hike into every sermon, every biblical teaching, every conversation that we had for the year previous. But that experience, that hike, brought a deep appreciation for Henry David Thoreau's idea of thriving. Here's what he said. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover I had not lived. My deliberate journey into those woods was a genuine experience of thriving for me in my life. I felt absolutely alive on every level. Yet in that moment, I wasn't prepared for the wilderness that was about to unfold in my life. A month later, in early September, our family gathered to celebrate our son Soren's birthday. On the way home that night, I was hit by a drunk driver, and the impact forced my truck over onto its driver's side, skidding along the freeway at about 50 miles per hour. With headlights and glass everywhere, it was quite a moment for me. Thankfully, I was able to walk away from that event physically unharmed, but soon the mental health challenges would emerge, making what would happen next that much more difficult. One month later, a month later to the date, in October, on the 7th, my dad, Jean Gaucher, came to the end of his long, remarkable life at the age of 92. While we expected that and in some ways were able to plan for it, however you do that, we were grateful for his amazing life, but still the grief for me was as thick as it could be. Now, while handling any two of those three events might have been manageable, 
the combined impact of all three of those events within such a short period of time was nearly overwhelming. And so I did the only thing I had left to do, and that was to ask for some help. I asked for some help, went to a counselor, we sat together, and we took care to put the pieces of my jumbled up life at that time sort of back in places where they seemed to make some sense, and I began a journey toward healing. But those three catalytic events eventually led to a deeply held insight that I hold to this day, that those things that happened did not happen to me. I was not a victim of all of those circumstances. Those events happened for me. They didn't happen to me, they happened for me. Embracing life's most challenging moments is never easy. It's never easy. But when they're infused with the power of the resurrection, there is always a promise, a promise of something more. There's a promise of something new and different something meaningful and life-giving, something deep, deeply hopeful, something thriving, because all of those moments have something to teach us in our lives. We're starting a brand new worship series that we're calling Thrive Era, which is as a result of all that I experienced in that time. Thrive Era is, of course, a fusion of two familiar words, Thrive and Era. The intention of this series is to explore what it means to have life and more life in every era, in every time, in every moment of our lives. Thrive Era, or the will to thrive, doesn't negate the difficult times that we experience in our lives, but allows us a companion to walk beside us through all of those times. And over the next seven weeks, we'll explore our identity together as followers of Christ, that we are spirited, creative, and connected people called to be present, grateful, generous, and missional with our lives. Those seven thriving rhythms will shape our thinking about what it means to be followers of a resurrected Christ who calls us to bring some good to each moment, something better to each day, and our best to each other as we experience the world around us. And as it turns out, that's been at the very heart and core of the Christian mission for over 2,000 years. Do you ever wonder what it was like for the disciples the week after? <laughs> like, what was it like for them? What was going on in their hearts and minds, kind of like us here today, a week later, wondering what all of that meant for them? For some, I suppose it was business as usual. I mean, some had to go back to their boats to their nets. Some of them had to, went back to their offices, to their day jobs. I mean, after all, they still had to feed their families, didn't they? They had to arrange for daycare and carpools and going back to school and, and all of that. But here's what we know 2,000 years later. The resurrection shifted everything, and along with those shifts came some questions. What did that mean? What did, what did that resurrection mean? The stone rolled away. He came out, breathing again, appearing to over 500 of his followers. What does that mean? How, how did the resurrection inspire them to live differently with those that they loved and know, knew? How did it inspire their relationships with people that they did not know yet? How would the resurrection infuse their relationships with one another? How did that resurrection change their lives? Friends, after the, after the resurrection of Jesus, we have to know this, and we know it from history, that the church, the early 
infant church struggled mightily. They struggled to thrive as they sought to understand their identity and purpose, their mission and their vision. Their identity. Who were they? Their purpose. What are, what are they doing here? Th their mission. Where are we going? And their vision. How will we get there? The first the first century church was just being harassed greatly by the persecution of the emperor Nero, who was an utterly horrible person. Throughout the whole Roman Empire, Christians were tortured and killed for their faith. And the church that had gathered and started in Jerusalem was now suddenly dispersed all over the Mediterranean world. As they struggled to embrace the mission of taking the gospel, the good news of that empty tomb, that risen Christ, to the world around them, to the ends of the earth, they were essentially asking these four core questions. Who are we? What are we doing here? Where are we going? And how will we get there? These questions came out for me out of that catalytic experience of those three experiences I had where I began to ask those questions. Who am I? What on earth am I doing here? Where am I going and how will I get there? The future of the church depends on followers of Jesus asking these questions all the time. Peter, the apostle, knew that this was happening in the early church. And so he wrote to those dispersed Christians around the Mediterranean world in the book of 1 Peter, in the second chapter. He gives them a very clear idea of who they are. He says, you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, every one of you, chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do God's work and to speak out for God, to tell others of the night and day difference God made for you, calling you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Peter wanted to bring clarity to the community of Christ followers in the world. And he was responding to these questions. The first, who are we? Who am I? This is a question that we get to ask every day. It reveals our identity. And on the very first page of the scriptures, in the book of Genesis, we learn our identity, that we are image bearers of the divine. That's who we are. We are image bearers of the divine. When you look at me and I look at you, we see... Christ embodied in our lives. We are the people of God, filled with the breath of the Spirit. To say that we are spirited is to, to carry in us the breath of God and to be aware of that, that every breath that we receive, not every breath we take, because breath is a gift to be received. Every gift, every breath that we receive is a gift. And we thrive because we've been chosen to be the animating presence of Jesus Christ in the world. Did you catch what Peter said? He said, you are the ones filled with God's spirit breath, chosen by God for the high calling of creative priestly work, chosen to be a, a holy, connected people. Friends, as image bearers of God, our identity is rooted in the one who is breathing, thriving life into us, every one of us, every single moment, every breath, a gift. But that leads to the second question. Peter was responding to that. What am I doing here? What, what are we doing here? That is the purposed question. What is our purpose as individuals and as a community faith, as a congregation? One of my theological heroes is St. Teresa of Avila, a beloved Spanish mystic 
and a Carmelite nun who lived during the 16th century in Spain. To the questions, who are we and what are we doing here? She writes, you are the presence of Christ in the world. Christ, who has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks with compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which Jesus walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which God blesses all the world. By asking, what are we doing here? We move toward a thriving clarity about our purpose as a congregation and people a part of that congregation. St. Teresa continues. She says, you are here to reach across the gap, across the chasm into the life of someone in need. You are here to be the hands, the feet, the eyes, the body of Christ because Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Seeking clarity about who we are and what we're doing here equips us to embrace our identity and our purpose as the people of God who also then ask the vision and the mission questions. The vision question, where am I going? Where are we going? That's our vision. It's out there in front of us. We hold it out here. Where are we going? We're going there with Christ, which leads to the mission question, how will we get there? How will we get there? Over the next seven weeks of the Thrive Era series, we'll explore this deepened sense of our identity as Christ followers, that we are spirited, creative, and connected people called to be present called to be grateful and generous and missional with our lives. If you're using the Welcome the Seasons Thrivera companion resource, every day will be a deeper dive into what that means and what that can look like in our lives. But as we do that, we'll come to a deeper appreciation of how this can impact each of our lives individually and as a community. And maybe that impact will look something like this. Take a look. Thriving doesn't necessarily mean everything in your life is going peachy. It means that everything that's happening in your life, you can thrive through them. It would would definitely encourage people to, um, to lean into those rhythms, to find a group of people where you can um, explore this, this together, that you can think about how you might incorporate these rhythms, some of that intention into into your daily life. What does it mean to be creative, connected, called to be present and grateful and generous and missional? That has reframed my whole life. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to give my whole self to that kind of thriving. It leads to better relationships with others. It leads to um, being more present. And I think it leads to, to more joy, ultimately. Friends, we are not standing at the doorway to the tomb looking into where Christ was, wondering what happened, although it's okay to ask those questions. But we, as a community of faith, are standing together, looking outward to where Christ is leading us. So how do we make this sticky? How do we find some intention about this? I want to challenge you this week to spend some focused time asking these questions, wrestling with the identity question, who are you? Not just your role as a parent or grandparent, as a single person, as a person in relationship. It's not what you do every day, your job or whatever, but who who are you? Who is Christ calling you to be? And then that leads to the next one. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? This is the purpose question, which then leads to the third question, the vision question, where am I going? We get to ask that with a sense of anticipation. Where am I going? Where are we going? 
which leads to the mission question. How will we get there? And we get to anticipate somehow how God is at work unfolding all of this in our lives as we move together. So friends, hold on to that. Spend some time with that because I think that when we come to the end of this part of the journey together, we'll discover that God is calling us into a deeply thriving, resurrected life. And to that, all God's people say, amen. I've said for what seems like almost forever that when we gather for a journey, a good first step is a meal. So as we begin our journey through this series, we begin with this meal, this table that Christ sets for us and the entire creation, set here for us where we, where we are reminded that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, friends, take this and eat this. This is my body given for you. After that, he took the cup gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people everywhere for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Well, friends, as you may know, at Prince of Peace, we celebrate an open table. Everyone is invited to come and receive the real presence of Christ through bread and wine. Wherever you are on your journey, Christ steps into that moment with you and says, eat, drink, be with me. The ushers will be directing you from your rows toward the aisles. They'll carry an offering basket. We thank you. We thank you for your ongoing generosity, which makes ministry happen. Whether you give online or in the baskets today, we are deeply grateful for our shared partnership in all of this. As you come to the serving stations, the bread server will have either a, a, a wafer or a gluten-free wafer. Simply ask for what you need and then step to the wine in the split chalice, the red wine or the white colored grape juice or the individual cups. And then you can dispose of the cup uh, at the wastebasket at the end of of the communion time. Also, friends, if, uh, if you are unable to come to us, let our ushers know we'll be honored to come and serve you where you are at. And if there's some young people uh, here who are still studying communion and all of that, please come anyway. We'd love to share a blessing with you. The table is set for the entire world. It is set for us in this place. Please come.
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
As always, the good news that follows our meal together is something that we get to proclaim out loud together, and here it is all together. In this sacrament, God renews, restores, and reconciles us as the body of Christ and sends us out in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news of the risen Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have created us in your image, breathed the oxygen of the Spirit into us, called us into deeper connections through community, and filled every present moment of our lives with more blessing than we can count. We are grateful this day and will commit ourselves to practicing gratitude, thanking you for your generous love that frees us to be your resurrected and missional people in the world. And in the midst of that, we do continue to bring to mind and hold in our hearts and lift up to you today all who continue to struggle with the daily challenges of life, those who are filled with fear and apprehension, those who struggle with addictions and powerlessness, those who deal every day with food and shelter insecurities, those who feel lost and alone. May what you do through us be an expression of your presence to those people as we gather around them and walk with them. We think of those who are praying for calm and peace this day, especially Paul and Judy Gilgey and their family as they love and support and comfort Judy in the end stages of her life. We especially commend into your care those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Specifically, we think of Mike and Sherry Miller and their family as they grieve the loss of Sherry's nephew. Oh, God, remind us again and again that you are our faithful God, that you walk deeply with us throughout life. All of this we pray in the strong name of Christ, our Lord, the one who has taught us all to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining us here today. And those of you who are worshiping online, thank you for being with us. Again, if you're here and you need more information about the mission and the ministry and how you can step into that, you can stop at the Connect desk in the community room. Someone will be uh, there to chat with you. And it still smells like bacon. That's so good. Bacon and everything else that goes with that. The men's ministry is still serving breakfast. We encourage you to, to join them and then to celebrate the quilters as they bring their marvelous works of art and display them in the community room. And now I'd like to invite all who are able to please stand for the sending blessing. And now, friends, as you go from this place, may you go equipped by the resurrected Jesus Christ to truly thrive as you bring some good to each moment, something better to each day, and your very best to each other and the world around us. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken My fear 